I'm so pleased to bring you this conversation on the Buddhist subtle body with my friend and colleague Simon Cox. I met Simon when he joined Rice's Department of Religion PhD program, and then I got to know him when he took two semesters of my Introduction to Tibetan Language and Culture class at Rice. Simon wrote his dissertation about the subtle body, so he's the perfect person to give us a deeper dive on that topic. Simon spent five years living and training in China under Master Yuan Xiu Gong at the Wudong Taoist Traditional Kung Fu Academy. While there, he studied Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation, herbal medicine, Taoist music, and ancient and modern Chinese language. After returning to the West, he received his PhD in Chinese and Tibetan mysticism at Rice University. You can read more about Simon and see some awesome pictures of his training in China on his website, which you'll find in the show notes. He's brilliant and great with languages, and I'm so pleased to share this conversation with you. Before we jump in, there are a couple of things I need to explain because this episode gets a little more academic than most. First, we'll be talking about the Buddhist tantras because that's where you find descriptions of the body's energy system or subtle body, so it'll be helpful to define tantra. What we're talking about are texts that have practices associated with them, often what's called deity yoga. These are typically rituals in which you imagine that you're in the presence of a Buddha, receiving blessings from that Buddha, and then you become that Buddha and try to keep that sense of living from your most awakened and wisest self. Also, we talk a few times about epistemology, which just means the study of how we know what we know. For something like sight, it's pretty straightforward. The Tibetan tradition would say that our eyes perceive the shape and color of an object, and then our conceptual mind labels it so we know what it is, like a desk or a flower. With something like the subtle body, it's less clear to what extent we're noticing something that's already there, and to what extent we're bringing about the thing we're noticing as we notice it. In Qigong, they say that where the mind goes, the qi flows. So even as we pay attention to the subtle body, we're already changing our experience of it. Finally, a few words about a school of Buddhism we're going to talk about. It's called Yogacara or Chittamatra. Yogacara means practitioners of yoga, and here yoga means transformative spiritual practice. Chittamatra means mind only, which refers to this school's philosophical view, which is that the main cause of our suffering is thinking that we're separate from the world around us. If you want a deeper dive, see the show notes for a link to an article on Yogacara. Welcome to Letting Grow, the podcast about one of the spiritual journey's most difficult and courageous moments, letting go of who we think we should be so we can grow into who we most deeply are. I'm your host, Claire Villarreal, and I appreciate your joining me today. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Uh, You are definitely like the most qualified person I know personally to have this conversation with about subtle body. And um, like I did an earlier episode on the death process in Tibetan Buddhism, and I kind of mentioned the subtle body, but I feel like it's such a big topic that it'd be super cool to to hear like a more in-depth description. And uh, I know you wrote your dissertation on this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, would you would you just share with us what is the Buddhist description of the subtle body, um, and we'll just we'll just go for there. Um, well, to say like the Buddhist description, I mean, as you know, Buddhism is a a massive kind of umbrella category that contains multitudes. Um, <laughs> so, I think. As far as when we're talking about like thanatology or narratives of, of death and dissolution of the body, really the, the kind of um, highest form of it in Buddhism of this discourse is in the Vajrayana stuff, specifically in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, this is really, really a, a topic that lots of people are curious about. It seems starting around the kind of 12th century, there's just this great flowering of authors who write their kind of own versions of what the subtle body is, its structure, its function, how it comes to be, and then how it dissolves. Um, so is that the sort of stuff 
Do you want to get into? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I actually didn't realize it was around that time. You know, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's always this narrative of like, this text that you're learning comes from the Buddha. Um, and obviously that's not, you know, factually or like in a Western historical sense, correct? So yeah, could you could you just say a little something about that time when this is all happening? Like, does anybody have a guess as to why that time was such a fruitful time for this kind of speculation? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the historical context, uh, which as Americans, this I think will we'll kind of we'll have an intuitive understanding of how this sort of was going on in Tibet, because um, starting in the seventh century, there's this movement kind of of the kings essentially in Tibet coordinating um, translation of uh, texts from um, various languages, actually Persian, Chinese, and Sanskrit at this early date. Um, and then later on, they kind of like narrow it down and they say, oh, we only want the stuff from India. Um, but that's kind of another story. Uh, but there's this great movement of this tantric literature uh, from Bengal and from kind of present day Pakistan, these different areas up through the Himalayas into Tibet. Um, and so over the course of a few centuries, they get tons and tons of tantras. Um, and a lot, uh, there's a problem is that the tantras don't all agree with one another. So they all have these different depictions of the body. It has this many channels, it has this many chakras and stuff like that. Um, and so it really became a sort of, people wanted to be like, well, what's the real um, nature of the body? And so you have all of these different intellectuals approaching it in kind of different ways. And so one of the early formulators, this guy, uh, Yang Gompa, he, his strategy was, well, I'm going to go and sit in a cave for 11 months and see what my own kind of experience tells me about the nature of the body. Um, and so he comes out kind of with his own way of talking about things. And a number of books about him have come out recently, really excellent scholarship on him. And he, yeah, he does stuff like, he's, oh, there's the chakras have this many spokes, they're this color. Um, another scholar, Rangjung Dorje, the third Karmapa, he has a very a kind of different way of doing things. And he kind of goes back through the old tantras and kind of synthesizes some information to arrive at his own thing, which he does a, this wonderful kind of 70 page poem on the nature arising structure and dissolution of the subtle body. Um, and then still another guy, Long Chempa, uh, he, um, well, he, his version of the subtle body is kind of gifted to him by these sky going uh, chondros, these deities that he's kind of in conversation with. Um, and he, he has a, a very unique subtle body kind of uh, layout. Um, that I translated part of that in my dissertation, actually. Um, so it's basically in the 12th century, 13th century is this time when a whole bunch of literature had come to Tibet and people were really trying to sort through it um, and figure out what was really going on. And there's a lot of systematizing that happens at this time of different sects, but also the systematizing of the structure of the subtle body is a major thing. Wow. I mean... So I personally practice in the Longchen Yingtik lineage, which is Longchenpa's lineage. So I had actually no idea that his vision is maybe atypical or unique. So I can totally relate. You know, you mentioned like modern people in the U.S. will probably be able to relate to this. I can totally relate because um, it seems like we get a lot of different images of the subtle body. And a lot of times people will even, you know, use the terms prana and chi and lung, which is a Tibetan for, for energy. They kind of use them interchangeably. And it seems like there's so much out there that it can maybe be difficult for people to realize that these are different systems. Um, so what would you say? Well, I guess, I guess to continue your story about how people were trying to synthesize this, um, was there, I kind of know the answer, but um, I'll let you say it. Was there one system that people came to or how did the Tibetans um, kind of reconcile these different systems they were inheriting? Um, well, the story with the medical, with the nature of the body is quite interesting because like I mentioned earlier, as far as Buddhism was concerned, uh, there was this famous debate that happened in the eighth century um, where the, a Chinese monk came and there was an Indian monk came and they had a debate. Um, and according to the Tibetan chronicles, the Indian monk uh, won. And so then everyone in Tibet was like, oh, we're going to go with the Indian stuff. Let's keep all this Chinese Buddhism stuff out of here because it's clearly inferior. Um, 
we've actually found other records of that debate in Dunhuang that say it was a tie. Um, so, you know, the, what actually happened is still a matter of speculation. Um, but Tibet, it made this definitive shift towards just getting their Buddhism from India. But the same king that hosted that debate between these two religious experts also hosted a medical conference where he invited uh, Indian physicians, Chinese physicians, and then physicians of the, the school of Galeno, which it sounds like Galen, the, the Greek kind of guy. So it's thought that it was probably some kind of um, uh, Persian uh, form of kind of Greco-Persian medicine that came. Um, but they didn't, with the medicine, they didn't have a debate. They had a conference, and they all got together, and they just synthesized everything. Um, and so, whereas they were very kind of like picky about their religion, they only got it from India with the medical stuff, they were extremely practical. And so they just took everything and threw it all together. Um, and this is still lives on in the kind of Tibetan medical tradition. It's highly syncretistic. It has aspects from Chinese medicine and obvious aspects, inheritance from uh, Ayurvedic medicine. It fuses this stuff together, no problem. It's the same in uh, Tibetan astrology, actually. They have like a totally, they pretty much absorb like all of Chinese astrology and then like all of, uh, you know, Vedic astrology. So it's like this uh, insanely complex astrological system. <laughs> and the same could be said about Tibetan medicine. It's extremely complex because they have this kind of synthesizing attitude. Wow. That is amazing. I never heard of the Galeno aspect. Like you hear about, and you can also kind of see the footprints in like Tibetan descriptions of the subtle body, if you want to call it that, of like the Indian and the Chinese systems. I had no idea about the potential like Western influence on that. Um, wow. So, so the Tibetan medical system becomes like very syncretic and just kind of tries to fuse all these different influences into one. Um, and I know I've read different, you know, tantric descriptions of the energy system of like the channels and the winds. Um, and it seems like everyone has their own description. So did like for the purpose of Dharma and tantric practice, as opposed to medicine, did people end up sticking with like different descriptions for different tantras? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> kind of the medical stuff is really nailed down by, uh, Yutok Yuntin Gompo, the, the younger, who was also, I believe, a 13th century physician who wrote what's called the four tantras, the Gyushi which really have a heavy kind of the imprint of Ayurvedic uh, medicine um, based on some sa older Sanskrit texts. And that's like, that becomes like the medical view of the body. But when you actually read the Gyushi, they're quite like uh, materialistic, you might say. They're all about like ailments, physical channels. So they're not really taken up with these esoteric conversations about like, oh, how many petals are there on the crown chakra and stuff. Because like, you know, that's not really super uh, urgent when you're actually dealing with sick people. <laughs> Right. Um, so, yeah, th that establishes, like you kind of implied, a kind of unique uh, medical tradition. And then alongside that, there are these kind of tantric views of the body. Um, and just as you mentioned, we have all of these different tantras. And um, a sort of, you know, around the 11th and 12th century, there was sort of this guy Naropa came along. And he kind of did like a greatest hits of the tantras and created what we call the, the six yogas of Naropa, kind of organized these um, and so you have these kind of, one of them is the inner heat yoga, which is just straight up the, out of the Havadra Tantra, um, which has its own vision of the body. But then you also have the kind of yoga of illusory body, which he pulls out of the Guhya Samadra Tantra. Um, and so, and then there are some from the Chakra Samvara Tantra. So he's pulling from these different, so, sorry if I'm getting, am I getting too, uh, too uh, academic here? <laughs> uh, I'm loving it. Okay, cool, cool. So the six yogas of Naropa are kind of, they, they draw from all of these different tantras and kind of, that have different visions of the body and different structures and functions and stuff like this. Um, and so it becomes kind of, uh, there's an extremely practical spirit when you actually read people writing about the subtle body and Tibetan stuff. Um, like Tsongkhapa, he writes his own commentary on the Guhya Samaja Tantra. And he's like, oh, in this tantra, there's this many chakras. In this tantra, there's this many chakras. Mm -hmm. And he's like, there's no problem. It's just like when you're working with this tantra, you do you do what it says. When you're that one, you do maybe four chakras. Um, and the same thing shows up in Long Champa. He's like, look, the conventional thing says there's five chakras. You can do that. But then these chondros, they told me that there's actually four. Um, and so then you do the four when you're doing these practices. Um, so because this has been like I mean, like the the American parallel is like lots of people are taken up with this in the kind of New Age discourse. 
Um, and in Tibet, you know, they inherited this vast trove of tantric literature. In America, in the 21st century, we have, with the internet, we have, like, everything. <laughs> we have, like, hermetic philosophy and, like, the Indian stuff, the Tibetan, the Chinese, and it's just all mashed together. And uh, <laughs> it's like no one really knows what to do with it all. Yeah. People are trying to synthesize and, like, push clump things together, and then you end up with these kind of, like, pseudo-Christian, like, uh, you know, creatures. Um <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting uh, time. Um, so this was these kind of strategies that people developed over centuries in Tibet for synthesizing and systematizing this information. I find it so fascinating. This is maybe a bit of a tangent, but I find it so fascinating that the Tibetans, like, because, you know, for back then, their, their transmission of Buddhism was so compressed. It was a couple hundred years. You yeah. know, and they really developed like these ways of of how do you compile things? What do you try and systematize? What do you leave separate? It's kind of a nice playbook, honestly, for people nowadays trying to figure out like how to slog through all the spiritual smorgasbord that we have available. Like, okay, sometimes you don't put things together, or sometimes they they are really similar, and you know, you mash them together because it's very practical. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm kind of curious. Um, I mentioned in an earlier episode of the podcast, and you often hear um, references to like the body's channels, um, like the, the traditional description of the energy system is the channels, winds and bright orbs or tile. Um, could you maybe just explain what those are and um, and how they function? Because I think that's probably the hardest aspect of a Tibetan model of a person for a Westerner to kind of grab onto and understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so kind of based on my own expertise and research, I will be talking about the kind of tantric presentations of these things, which yeah. does differ slightly from the kind of medical stuff. Um, yeah. Because there are trained Tibetan medical doctors to this day, and their knowledge is like, you know, astronomical. It's, it's pretty incredible what they know. And so I won't even kind of pretend <laughs> um, to be able to speak on the, the kind of medical side of this stuff. But since I've read these tantras and commentaries and stuff like that, um, I can kind of talk a little bit about how it works in those contexts. Yeah, that'd be great. Because that is where you find instructions on, on the death process and how to train for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, maybe the easiest way would be to do the kind of... Uh, narrative um because it starts um from birth embryology to mm -hmm. create your physical being and then the kind of thanatology or disillusion as you die um and the death process is just the mirror image of the birth process so this arising and kind of passing away um are kind of the same process forward and backward um and so typically, you know, you've talked about bardos and bardo beings and consciousness wandering through the intermediate states. Um, so if there's a kind of wandering bardo consciousness, um, uh, based on karmic tendencies, it will feel attraction toward the um, white and red substances produced by the male and female. Um, so these are the, the tigles, like you mentioned, um, which tigle is an extremely kind of problematic term. Um, is there a, a translation that you go with, Claire? What, what, what did you? Um, I think Anne Klein, who is a, an advisor to us both, uh, I think her current translation, or at least the one that I'm familiar with from her translation of the foundational practices text is bright orbs. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, it's right. a tech, it, you can't really explain it with a translation. It's almost like you have to explain it with like a small teaching on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, or even like a, it means very different things in different contexts. Yeah. Um, so in this context, uh, when the bardo consciousness encounters these, these tigles, um, the white one for men that corresponds with semen and the red one from the woman that corresponds with uterine blood, um, uh, they fuse together and the kind of the heat of, of sex um, kind of melts them. And it becomes really, really kind of yummy to the bardo consciousness and it latches onto these. And uh, Rangjung Dorje, the third Kamarapa, in his text on this, he says that it's like the bardo consciousness becomes drunk. It kind of latches onto these tigles, and it becomes like really drunk and just disoriented. And boom, <laughs> that's how you incarnate. Um, <laughs> oh my god, I love that so much. Yeah. I've never heard that drunkenness description before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So I actually, in, in my dissertation, I used the term congealed essence to translate tikle. Mm -hmm. um, and Anne Klein, our advisor, was like, oh, this is kind of a weird translation. Where'd you get that from? Um, and it's actually kind of a funny story because I was, uh, well, you know the Ewoks. Ewoks speak Tibetan. <laughs> Yeah, 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 in uh, Return of the Jedi. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It's like some. Uh, there's like recordings from some like guy's field work in Omdo or something like that. I think. What? Yeah, yeah, and like you know when they, they find like first encounter C three PO, they're saying oh, 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 and it's actually like a a prayer to Amitabha. Um, yeah. And so when Han, when C three PO later he's telling the story of uh, kind of Han Solo and frozen in carbonite to the Ewoks, he says Han Solo Tiglo carbon. And T, I was like, oh, Tiglo, frozen. And so, so I look it up in this kind of like a um, Sino-Tibetan etymological dictionary, and Tik has this meaning of like congeal or frozen. Um, oh, interesting. And so I was like, oh, that really makes sense. That these like they're kind of like frozen substances. These Tiklates. Um, yeah, because they were like the essence of your of your like, well, body, right? Yeah, yeah, like the most essential essential of energies, basically. Wow. Yeah. And so one uh, commentary I read talks about how teak means like frozen, congeal, and then lay means like spread out. Um, so it has this oh. dual aspect to these. Wow. That is so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever gotten such an in-depth de explanation of just the term teak lay. So this is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, C-3PO, right? <laughs> the dharma of star wars <laughs> yes the term of star wars chinese or tibetan etymology and return of the jedi yes. yeah <laughs> um so so anyway so to, to go back to our the narrative of the kind of arising of the subtle body um and this is mostly in accordance with um rongjung dorje's text the third karmapa because like i said there are different texts and if you go into like long champaville his text is, is totally unique yeah um uh, his uh uh, Tsikdunza is the text where he, he goes through this stuff, uh, mm -hmm. and his is very uh, interesting. Um, but so in the third Karmapa's kind of telling, um, this kind of bardo consciousness gets drunk on these combined melted red and white essences, um, and that's when it, the whole thing begins. So then these essences, they kind of um, congeal a little bit again, and then they separate. Um, and in their separation, uh, a little channel forms between them, and the white essence um, goes up and the red essence goes down and in between them a blue central channel arises and then from this central channel uh, over the course of the kind of um, natal periods the chakras form on it these kind of um, like wheels that then have spokes and then the spokes have spokes and these form this sort of like capillary system of energetic channels um, and so you have chakras and then channels and then different kinds of winds start moving through these, this channel network. And at this point, you, you, there's still not really a physical body yet. This is just the energetic substrate on which the physical body eventually arises. And so once all the, the winds have formed in the channels, you have an upward moving wind and a downward moving wind. And these cause the whole energetic structure to kind of start rattling. And this rattling is what, starts, what gives rise to the physical bones that grow on this structure. And so then bones, and then flesh, and then your sense organs, and eventually you have the, the whole baby gets fleshed out. Um, mm. And so, you know, then you have a baby, and uh, it's, uh, it's born and becomes a person. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, in, in, this, this, in this way, this is why the subtle body is really significant for these different kind of tantric practices, because... Um, it's kind of halfway between you as a physical being and that bar traveling bardo consciousness that you're kind of like trying to get back to. Um, mm. And so the, the path to your kind of pure experience of consciousness is through this uh, subtle body that forms. Hi friends, want to join the Letting Grow tribe? I'll be starting a bi-weekly newsletter in early 2021 with links to articles, YouTube videos, other podcasts, and basically the best of the Rebirth content I've come across lately. Some examples of the kinds of things I want to share with you include a snap judgment story about a bull who seemed to be the reincarnation of another bull, a viral article about the creepy things kids say, 
but some of them 100% seem to refer to previous lives, and some excerpts from the book I'm writing now about the lessons Tibetan Buddhist teachings on life and death offer to those of us going through transitions. Spoiler alert, that's all of us. Best of all, if you're subscribed, you'll get links to join free, live video calls with me and other subscribers every couple of months. So pause this episode now, find the newsletter sign-up link in the show notes, and join your tribe. It's really great to kind of pull together these different pieces of the tradition. Um, like I, I created a, a course on, you know, the Bardo states and more recently what they have to 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 say about um, transitions and specifically the COVID-19. And I kind of dove into Tibetan embryology on my own, um, but I'd never heard some of these details. Like it's actually the separation of the white and red tigle or drops that creates that channel between them. Um, yeah, so I guess this kind of leads into like the next question that I have, um, which is, in this system, in this way of thinking about a human, there's obviously body, which is the most like gross, and then energy, and then there's mind. Um, can you, my understanding is that energy kind of holds all three levels together. Like mind is, you know, extremely subtle, but there's still something, if we're talking about conventional mind, there's still something tied into our energy system about it. So could you explain how energy holds all these three levels together or what role does it play? Yeah. Um, so one of the unique things that about this kind of um, Vajrayana subtle body discourse that separates it definitively from say like Taoist discourses or even uh, Hindu ones um, is that it's all based on the kind of, this specific philosophical school that arose within mm -hmm. Mahayana Buddhism in the uh, fifth century, the Yogacara metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, and this is variously called like mind only school. This is a translation of Chittamatra or, um, you know, a kind of phenomenological ontology. If you're being really, really uh, pedantic about it. <laughs> um, but basically in this kind of telling of things, there's this base level of consciousness um, that's like uh, contains everything. Um, and then there's a kind of like energetic wave that causes ripples in this consciousness. And the consciousness uh, for split seconds will forget, will see a, a wave and forget that it's part of itself. And for like, boom, there's a moment of dual duality that arises. Um, and that's the, what the third Karmapa talks about um, in this context is that there's this originary consciousness and then there's what's called nunyi or uh, klesha manas um, mm. or like the this the seventh consciousness in a consciousness of yogacara um, <laughs> and there's the energetic movement um, causes a ripple that causes this moment of disjunction between subject and object mm. um, and then everything is kind of like built upon that um, so this like afflictive energetic movement is the only reason that we have this perception of duality at all. Mm -hmm. And everything kind of arises from that. Um, but this is a really kind of abstract and metaphysical answer to your question, perhaps like too <laughs> abstract. Um, so that there's like lots of different kinds of, of energy in the body. Right. Um, and so even what, when I mentioned this kind of like, formation of the subtle structure of the body, these five winds start blowing through the different channels. These are the mm -hmm. lungs, which people sometimes liken to prana or chi, um, which, I mean, you know, th th that's okay. I think you can do that. Um, <laughs> and so these different lungs have different functions. Um, but oh yeah, so the, the point I was getting to, I think, with this, this wave-causing form of formative mentation, is how some people translate it, is that mm -hmm. that then becomes what's called your sok lung or life force lung, mm -hmm. which is like based in your heart and is the energy that kind of keeps you alive. And so when that lung dissolves, the, it kind of corresponds with your the death of the physical body. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing that keeps you alive is the, the very kind of like problematic wave causing lung that, you know, stirred things up in the first place. 
it's such a fascinating and like such a Buddhist perspective on on like what our life depends on. That basically it's karma. I mean, you didn't use the word, but it's sort of it's karma. It's it's a moment of disjunction and then following after that in some way that creates actually the quasi physical support for our life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, a moment of ignorance. Um, yeah. Which is why you want awakening or enlightenment to <laughs> kind of get back. So it sounds like from your description, this um, soklung or like the sort of the life energy that creates the impetus for our life, creates a life force that keeps us alive. Yeah, that in a way that's that's what kind of drives us into each lifetime. We wouldn't be here without it. And as soon as it like breaks down, this lifetime is over, right? Mm-hmm. So, so from there, and I guess also from this like model of embryology, it sounds like the first thing that develops is, you know, the energy system winds, you know, lung, this energy begins to flow through the developing channel system. Um, one thing I'm curious about, I, I want to ask about the connection with the body in a second, but one thing I'm curious about is that the mind Um, obviously like the ultimate mind is not dependent on any of these quasi physical bases, but the conventional mind is, um, and I'm curious, could you, could you say more about the connection between energy or, or these winds and the conventional mind? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's, um, so mind is, we have this term mind in English, right? And it, it's just extremely broad, right? It, there's so much that's contained. And I, you, you and I have had this conversation so many times, Claire, about the kind of like uh, epistemological poverty of the English language, which English is such a rich language. We have it's, yeah. it's so many, it's so many things tossed together. But when it comes to talking about mind and the nature of mind, we're really quite poor when you compare English to something like Sanskrit where there's, you know, there's like 15, 16 different words for all these different kinds and levels of mind, and, um, and Chinese as well, and, and Tibetan. Even Very Tibetan, yeah. Letters. Yeah, <laughs> we're talking about this stuff. Um, so when you talk about the subtle body and its formation, uh, different kinds of mind arise with the different chakras. Um, mm. So for example, um, when your navel chakra grows on that central channel, uh, it's kind of... Um, it's thought to correspond with your eye consciousness in, mm-hmm. in some systems. Different people have different correspondences here. Um, but it's so sort of like eye consciousness from the navel chakra, ear consciousness from uh, the heart chakra. I think throat is just like bodily heat or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like heat consciousness at the throat chakra. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, tactile consciousness kind of at the secret chakra at the genitals. Um, so as each of these things arises, these different sensory awarenesses, which correspond with different forms of mind, is how they think of it in Tibetan Buddhism, mm-hmm. a kind of form at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. And so your, your mind is totally kind of dependent on these kind of uh, energetic nodules in your body. Um, and when they form, that form of consciousness expresses. And so then in the dying process, when your kind of sight grows dim, um, that's the dissolution of your um, navel chakra. And, you know, when your ears kind of have problems hearing, then your heart chakra is dissolving and so on and so forth. And so there's this kind of like losing of all of your senses as you approach death. Um, and that corresponds with the dissolution of your chakras. They actually like these energetic centers are dissolving, dissolving, dissolving until eventually they're all gone and you have no kind of sense consciousnesses whatsoever anymore. And then those red and white tea glaze that separated to form your central channel, um, the white one starts to descend and you'll have this experience of like brilliant light. And then the red one will start to ascend and you'll have this like red, like a sun blasting right in your consciousness. And then they both move towards your heart and they kind of squeeze your consciousness in between it. And in this squeezing thing, it's like complete darkness. Um, and then they combine and you experience fully the nature of mind in uh, that kind of moment. Um, so, yeah, the, the, your consciousnesses, your different forms of mind are completely 
dependent on these different energetic structures. Wow. I've heard the analogy so many times that mind rides on energy. Mm. Um, I'm curious to hear, because you've done a much deeper dive on this than I have, I'm curious to hear more about that relationship. You know, is mind made of energy? Is it a subtle form of energy? Like, what does it mean for mind to ride on energy? I mean, like, I guess I should just maybe explain for those who are less familiar, you know, what you're describing is each of these sense consciousnesses is dependent on um, an energy center. And you hear often, you know, in descriptions of meditation, like you want the, the body's energy to flow smoothly so that your mind and your attention, your concentration can also be smooth and, you know, robust. Um, but I've never heard like an in-depth description of what it really means for mind to ride on consciousness or to, you know, what, is there something riding on it? Is it the same thing? Like what, tell me, Simon, just explain, explain the nature of mind to me, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on that specific metaphor, um, once again, we're kind of invoking the epistemological richness of the Tibetan language. Um, the, the very, the form of mind that rides on the horse is the yi mind, um, Y-I-D mm. in Tibetan. Which uh, kind of uh, really miraculously corresponds with what's called the yi mind in Chinese. It's the same exact word, and both of these kind of minds they ride on horses. Um, Whoa, you, interesting. Yeah, and ch- it's a bit different in China that the yi mind kind of lives in your spleen, um, but it, it's a totally different system that the way they think about <laughs> mind and the body in China. Um, but it, it also rides on horses, uh, yi ma in, mm-hmm. in Chinese. You, you talk about Xin Yuan Yi Ma, the, the monkey mind up here that mm-hmm. lives kind of in your heart, and then monkey mind E that lives in your spleen. Um, and so, but in Tibetan, we talk about the Lung Ta, right? The, um, mm-hmm. the uh, wind horse. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's like you have these winds, they're blowing through your body. Um, kind of like, uh, again, uh, gosh, I mean, to, to invoke another horse metaphor, um, and I hate, I hate doing this, but uh, you could talk, think about it in terms of like the Freudian id. Mm, it's like interesting, uh, which he likens to a horse that's like uh, kind of out of control, um, huh. and so you need a rider to kind of like rein the horse in, mm-hmm. and that's what the the e does. It kind of like you have all these energies moving through your body, and if you use your e, you can kind of harness these energies and use them in, in fruitful ways. Otherwise, you're just kind of like all over the place. Um, mm. You become the kind of like uh, maybe ideal capitalist consumer, uh, <laughs> no thinking, just buying, consuming. Um, so yeah, it's this specific, and that, that E is also is the same kind of mind that caused that original wave in the mm. uh, kind of originary the kunchi, the kind of nature of mind. Mm. Um, so it's this. He, he kind of causes problems, but at the same time, it's the very mind that you use to kind of pull in your energies and steer them. Um, and in internal practices, this is the kind of mind also that you use to, to lead energy around your body and stuff. Um, so once again, to, to use the Chinese uh, kind of analogy, there's a saying, yi dao, qi dao. So where the yi, go, where the yi mind goes, mm. the qi flows. Um, mm. And so this is the one that you're leading stuff around by using this sort of mind. If I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like there's a lot of executive function to this yi mind. Um, I mean, again, yi is like this word in Tibetan that has different uses in different contexts. Um, I've never heard, I've never heard it quite explained in this way before. But it sounds almost like there's, um, I don't know, a sense of like agency that isn't dependent on the energies. It's more leading the energies. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean, insofar as in the embryological narrative, this form of mind actually exists before the formation of the energetic structures. Oh, um, interesting. So this is the one that it causes that original wave, and then that launches the whole process of the embryological kind of development. Um, mm. So there is a sense in which the yi is uh, kind of above um, the energetic structures of the particular chakras that give rise to the different forms of sense consciousness and mind and stuff like that. Wow. And sim- similarly, in Yoga Chara, it's it's also the seventh of the eight consciousnesses. Um, so it's the it's the closest consciousness to your like base storehouse nature of mind consciousness. Just hearing that description, it strikes me that 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 yi capability is what maybe many of us would think of as ourselves. Um, 
it sounds like it would be difficult to discriminate the difference between that sort of guiding function and, well, I mean, it sounds like that guiding function is the one that really kind of stands out for most of us as who we are. Uh, and it's, you know, well, I guess let me ask this as a question. So during, so during our lifetime, this yi is kind of um, either corralling our horses of the of the winds or it's not <laughs> and then what happens during the death process to this yi aspect of us because there is a moment at which there's nothing there but buddha nature so right. where does it go <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so so in the death process right so as you're being born your chakras arise and the different chakras correspond with the arising of different forms of sense consciousness and so these sense consciousnesses, they also correspond with elements. As the body is born, it, it's kind of this, this process of the creation of the elements as well. Um, and so out of uh, just pure consciousness, um, the kind of wind moves, and then you have the kind of wind element. And then from wind, fire is born. And then from fire, um, water is created. And then from water, earth is born. And this corresponds also with the arising of the chakras and the development of this energetic substructure of the human organism. And so when you die, it, like I said in the beginning, it's the reverse of this process. So the navel chakra dissolves and then earth dissolves into water. And then the heart chakra dissolves and you start having kind of like a dry mouth, dry tongue. You, your ear consciousness kind of vanishes and you become a little confused and agitated. Um, and then water dissolves into fire at, at the throat. And you, then kind of you start becoming cold your extremities become cold, your body becomes cold, and then your mind kind of vacillates between clarity and dullness. And sometimes you can't even recognize objects or people anymore. Um, and that's the kind of dissolution of the throat chakra. Um, and then you start having problems breathing. Um, and kind of exhalations get longer and longer, inhalations get shorter and shorter. You start losing tactile consciousness. Um, and that's the kind of dissolution of the secret chakra at the genitals, which is wind d dissolving into consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and so once earth has dissolved into water, water into fire, fire into wind, and wind into consciousness, all that's left is this kind of consciousness, but it's still a little bit disturbed. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when this sort of like dissolution of the subtle body happens, which is when the white tigle moves from the top, the red tigle moves from the bottom, and they approach the heart. Um, uh, where the heart chakra kind of used to be <laughs> before it dissolved. Um, and here is where you experience the white and then the red and then the total darkness. Um, and then that's when consciousness dissolves into space and you're in that completely dark place, but there's still that wave of, of formative mentation. But then for a, a moment, space dissolves into pure light. And that is when you kind of get back to the full nature of mind. And in all of these, pretty much everyone agrees, this is like a fantastic opportunity uh, to achieve enlightenment. Um, <laughs> if you can recognize the nature of mind in this moment, that's like the, the kind of most expeditious escape route from samsara, right? <laughs> I love it. The most expeditious escape route from samsara. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Somehow my mind just interprets this into like a like a visual system where it's like, you know, you've got earth sort of at the top and then water and you're sort of getting subtler and subtler. And it just feels like there's some really significant threshold that your I don't know, consciousness or you can't even really call it mind at that point that it crosses to dip down into that, that like space with no ye, no, not even like a space element. Um, I, there's not even a question here. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the awesomeness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess that was my, that was my question about the relationship between mind um and there's all these different words for like conventional mind in tibetan yi or sam or lo like all these different terms to convey like it's it's mind but it's not buddha nature um so clearly that layer of our being is very wrapped up with or like very connected with the energy system of the body to zoom all the way out to the other side, what's the relationship between like the physical body and the energetic system? Maybe I should preface that by saying like, I feel like Western science has a hard time defining what life is. 
Um, and it seems like there's a different answer here. So yeah, yeah, what is that relationship between the wind and the body in the system? Like, what is the relationship between um, our physical body and the energy body? Um, well, I think the kind of the embryological narrative kind of il illustrates how that what that relationship is that the physical body is just the kind of like well you might say like full pheno typical expression of the kind of um yeah energetic development uh but i mean so this is where we get into the kind of like tibetan medical tradition which i'm i'm much less qualified to speak of because th there's extremely um kind of well developed physiological mm -hmm. explanations for a huge range of human behaviors um, like I said, that the medical tantras, they're actually metaphysically quite materialistic. Um, they don't have all of these appeals to complex Yogacara philosophy. Um, it's about these kind of red channels and white channels that move through your body. And so w when you're doing um, kind of tantric practices, you're actually only focusing really on like a few chakras and these three channels, a blue one that runs through the center and then a red and a white one that are either on the left or right, uh, kind of depending on who you ask and depending on what gender you are. Um, and, uh, so it, it's a pretty kind of like mean and lean subtle physiology mm -hmm. you're using to do these energetic manipulations. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty universal across even like the different tantras and stuff like that. Um, whereas when you get into the medical tradition, um, like even in the tantric scriptures, I'll talk about, well, there are actually 72,000 channels, or in fact, these 72,000 have subsidiary channels. It's actually 84 million. <laughs> and then these, even these have subsidiaries, it's actually over 3 billion. Um, and so you have, you get to these like wild numbers and usually they have some more sort of like numerological and astrological significances. Um, but this is really the, the kind of domain of the, the medical tradition. Um, and so extremely kind of complex diagnostic methods that are dependent on very, um, complex understandings of the nature of your kind of structural, uh, energetic structure and its relationship with, um, yeah kind of different etiologies. So if I were to like kind of simplify it, I mean, my impression, and it kind of sounds similar to what you're saying, is that we have this energy system um, and from our main chakras, there's just an almost infinite proliferation of like smaller and smaller channels out. I tend to, I guess, almost unconsciously think of the physical body as like the outgrowth, like the logical outgrowth of the energy system and the way that it kind of feeds our whole being, not just our physical body, our, our, but our, you know, our energy system, our mind too. Um, is it fair to think of the body as being kind of like the, almost just like a more like one layer grosser than the energy system. And then the energy system just kind of feeds everything and keeps us alive. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, it's all karma. Um, so the physical body that you manifest is a result of past karmas. Um, so the fact that you're a human is typically a pretty good sign of Buddhism. <laughs> um, it's continued a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty lucky incarnation. Uh, you know, some millennials might argue with that. You know, I can understand that being a human is kind of a bummer sometimes, but um, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, you're depending on your karmic seeds, you, you'll mm. develop a different physical body. So that's, that's mm. the kind of why of why you have this, this body. Um, but yeah, that relationship, it, it, the physical one body is very, is very much kind of subsists and is nourished by, um, sisters on and is nourished by the different energetic flows through these kind of, uh, the mm -hmm. channels, the ta in Tibetan, which literally means like root. Um, so the Tibetan word is quite unique because it, it's root mm -hmm. that has this like very capillary system kind of feel to it. Whereas it's very different from the, t the Sanskrit term nadis, mm -hmm. which means, uh, you know, like river. Um, and the, the Chinese term typically is jing, which means like the, the weft in like weaving. Um, but they also have an aquatic mm. metaphor, mai, which means like vessels, like reservoirs in the Chinese ones. Um, mm. But I think these different metaphors are important. So the Tibetan one is, is roots. So you can think of like a root <laughs> capillary, you know, rhizomatic <laughs> system. It's the, the Deleuzian subtle body. It. Yeah. It's funny. Like I... <laughs> I know the word sa, but I never thought of it before as like a root system that branches out in that way. Wow, that's a great, that's a great description, a great metaphor. 
one final question. This is a completely different topic, but I'm I'm kind of wondering to wrap up this section. You've obviously done a really deep dive into the energy system of the body, um, a lot of the systems that support these different theories of the body. What does it what does it do for you in daily life to have this understanding and to have all the practices that go with like this attention to the energy body? Does it does it change the way you feel in your life or the way you go through life? Um, I mean, like <laughs> my life has been like devoted to this stuff. So it's like, th- there's not really a separation between this line of inquiry and my life. I sort of, um, I talk about this kind of in my dissertation, which is my, a forthcoming book actually through Oxford. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, the, the genealogy of the subtle body. We're still working on a title title. That's not totally nerdy. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, like I, I tell the story of how I kind of started like any 1980s kid watching cartoons with the kind of mystical orient, and then they had these kind of subtle anatomies. There's this episode of Batman where he learns like the touch of death, and the whole thing is based on this like these energetic structures in the body that he, he comes to understand them and has this great esoteric kind of awakening. Um, and I just basically um, took these things like way too seriously. <laughs> and explored these like like very kind of dedicated my life to these sort of lines of inquiry and learning kind of all these different languages to explore these things in their primary literatures. Um, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> this uh, absolutely affects how I live and see everything. And but I mean, I spent like six years in, in a Taoist temple. I've done lots of meditation. Your vision of reality just completely uh, changes when you we do, do these practices like a whole lot. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? It does. I mean, in a way it's kind of an unfair question because like for me too, I started meditating when I was like maybe 20. So it's kind of impossible to say like, oh, what does meditation do for you? Well, (laughs) what does air do? (laughs) (laughs) It's there. I breathe it. If I didn't, I'd probably die. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, you know, for myself, knowing this other dimension of like the body and dimension of the mind and, you know, being able to sort of, the more I work with these kind of practices, the more I feel the connections beyond myself too, you know, to the seasons, to the outdoor world around me. And um, it's just such a source of like richness and profundity, even in just, you know, so-called ordinary daily life. Um, And that is actually one of the aspects of your dissertation I really enjoy is, you know, what does this mean to you and to your Mm -hmm. life? And I'm really looking forward to your book coming out um, so that we can uh, maybe share links with everybody and they can enjoy a deep dive on this too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, so so this this Tibetan stuff is like um, mostly an intellectual endeavor of mine. Uh, so I lived in the Chinese context, and the practices I've done have been predominantly Taoist, um, mm-hmm. kind of, you can call them yogas, I guess, people don't like that, in, <laughs> in kind of sinosphere, but uh, Taoist energetic practices, meditations, and stuff like that. And so those have a very much more of a kind of, um, you might say, pastoral uh, kind of mm-hmm. nature-based thing where you're really incorporated into seasons and cycles and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. versus this kind of, these are very kind of intellectual forms of the Tibetan Vajrayana that I've explored through graduate school and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So for sure, yeah, it, it affects my relationship with uh, kind of reality itself down to plants and animals and people. That is super cool. Well, thank you so much, Simon. I feel like this is a real pleasure to get to hear such a, a lucid and accurate account of all this stuff. And I learned a lot. So cool. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into Buddhist ideas about the body's energy system. And in our next interview episode, I'll talk to Simon about his own journey from childhood in Houston, loving Batman episodes that dealt with mystical topics, to his time studying Kung Fu on a mountainside in China, training with a Taoist master, to writing his dissertation on the subtle body. 
Thanks for coming along for today's exploration of the process of letting grow. If you found this episode helpful, please share it. And subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts so you're always in the loop. For links to more content related to today's episode, please see the show notes. See you again next week.